So we're going to change tact a little bit and talk about a hormone um, which has received a lot of recent attention because it's become available on the PBS, which it wasn't for many, many years, as many of you will know here. So I thought it was timely to, to share it um, with you about what's going on in this space. And just to mention that amongst the medical people, we have also tried with the question about how does everyone keep up with what's going on in this field, we have recently formed the Australian New Zealand Pituitary Alliance, which is a group of health uh, like doctors, basically across the multidisciplines, working together across Australia and New Zealand to try to upskill each other on what's going on. What we are not going to talk about today is the proposed benefits of growth hormone as an anti-aging medication, <laughs> all right? So that's not what we're talking about. Equally, there's obviously I mean, and you have to sift through when you go onto the web, onto the, onto Google, through all of this to actually appreciate that there's a multitude of this stuff out there rather than actual true growth hormone deficiency. So obviously, growth hormone is used illicitly in many athletes, and in fact, more commonly with the availability of things that you can get online, um, there's a rising student use of human growth hormone, as was noted in a study recently in the in the US. So a big problem. This is the situation where we face real true life adult growth hormone deficiency. So a 43 year old male who was treated for a non-functioning pituitary adenoma, surgery 13 years ago, followed by radiation on all of the tumor, uh, you know, pituitary hormone replacement therapy, who really has primary concerns at this point of increasing central weight around the tummy, fatigue, poor concentration, lax motivation, physical strength has gone down, and they have low bone density. That's what we really face as um, for, for true adult growth hormone deficiency. So what are we looking at in terms of growth hormone? This is some history here. 1909, actually removing the pituitary in a growing animal was demonstrated first to, to stop growth. It wasn't until 1945 that actually growth hormone was isolated as, an, as a separate hormone. In 1957, pituitary growth hormone extract was actually first administered to a human wasn't until 1980 that was growth hormone was able to be produced by genetic engineering. 1988, first growth hormone clinical trials overseas. And in Australia, approved according to the TGA, but not PBS, in 2000. And then, as many of you know in the room, multiple submissions over time, multiple advocacy, including with the APF trying to get behind the patients, um, rejection after rejection. Um, from PBAC and then finally again with another go 2018 last year finally PBS listing and we're, met, we're way behind other countries in this domain which for, for a developed country was quite um, embarrassing. Anyway we also know so we've talked a lot about the pituitary and where it's located and the types of hormones Nell's nicely introduced in terms of growth hormone the control of it at the pituitary level and the actions of it elsewhere in the body are very, very complicated. Um, and I've just illustrated this, that it has multiple reaching effects on bone, on um, cholesterol, on the heart, on muscle, on the liver, and multiple regulation based on stress, exercise, different other hormones acting at the level of the pituitary to control the release of growth hormone. It's comp quite complicated. Throughout life, growth hormone Obviously, as a child, we associate it with growing and development. When that stops, but also as a child, metabolic functions of growth hormone are clearly apparent and very important. And that's what some of the focus, obviously, of my talk today will be on. You get a spike of growth hormone, obviously, around the time of puberty, um, but we have growth hormone present in normal adults throughout our life, although the levels do decrease with time. So as I touched on, the role of growth hormone in adult life is to regulate the metabolic and structural function of a multitude of organs and tissues. Heart to maintain output and proper function, the kidney retaining salt and water, muscle for mass and strength, bone for growth and development, the liver producing growth factors appropriately, metabolism and lipids, um, in the fat tissue for the proper use and, and metabolism of lipids, in brain for brain cell growth, and in the blood for red cells and the immune system. So very important. So when it goes awry, when you're deficient, these are some of the things that happen. Abdominal obesity, meaning tummy gets um, more obviously fat around the belly. Increased fat mass, predominantly around the belly. Reduced muscle mass and strength. Reduced fitness, bone loss and fracture risk. 
thin dry skin, unfavourable lipids or cholesterol and a diminished quality of life, fatigue, poor concentration, low mood, lack of motivation and social isolation. So you can see there a figure of a fit person with normal levels of growth hormone versus someone who has growth hormone insufficiency where their proportion of fat is much more increased and the lean muscle mass is decreased. So before this talk, I decided to quiz some of my patients with growth hormone deficiency on how it was living with growth hormone deficiency. I felt and cared about practically nothing. This is with living with growth hormone deficiency. I was not able to get out of bed. Just getting through a normal day was a struggle. It was like looking through a window pane out at life. I was just going through the motions. Life was running away from me. It was difficult to find the joy in life. Weight piled on my midsection. I was unable to recall simple facts. I was self-conscious and had low self-worth. I would regularly have to cancel social commitments. I was a burden on my partner and family. I felt I had brain fog and lack of mental clarity. And many of you probably can relate to some of those things. So this is courtesy of Ken Ho, Professor Ken Ho, who's um, one of my mentors. And um, this is not trying to go along the line of the bodybuilding issue, but this is just to highlight that this was a well patient who had, um, you know, was obviously interested in bodybuilding prior to the development of their tumour and then became growth hormone deficient. And you can see the change in the physique that occurs. So adult growth hormone deficiency, all parts are present, but everything is an effort. And I think many of you will relate to that. So what are the causes of growth hormone deficiency? Well, clearly any pituitary adenoma um, and the, the, even just from the presence of the tumour or the, the um, treatment effects that are required to, to get rid of the tumour can ultimately lead to growth hormone deficiency. But there are other tumours around the cellar area, around the pituitary area, which ultimately can lead to growth hormone deficiency. And as I mentioned, surgery or radiation in that area. Head injury is another big area which we're focusing on trying to capture um, is patients who have usually severe head injury can ultimately have growth hormone deficiency. Various infections in the brain, congenital defects as well, which are rare, but where the, where the pituitary fails to develop properly. Um, Sheen syndrome, which is due to severe blood loss at the time of childbirth. And then in children, sometimes it's idiopathic or we don't know the cause. So who should be tested? Anyone with a pituitary tumour who's had um, a large tumour or had surgery or radiation with a clinical suspicion and or at least one other hormone deficiency and you'll co I'll come to show you some um, statistics in a minute. Brain tumours where radiation is in involving the pituitary area, childhood growth hormone treatment, there are people who we need to be retesting um, and moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. But just to highlight that isolated isolated by itself, growth hormone deficiency does not arise in adults without there being some suggestion of an organic cause um, or evidence of pituitary disease. You don't just develop growth hormone deficiency, okay? So there is an increasing likelihood, this is a nice study done a few years ago now, the increased likelihood of growth hormone deficiency occurring where you have m increasing numbers of other pituitary axis hormone deficiencies. So if you end up with or if you're on replacement for three or four other hormones, you are almost 100% likely to have a growth, to have growth hormone deficiency as well. And this was a study looking at many of the axes of pituitary hormones, but you can see that growth hormone after radiation can take up to 35 years to develop in a few cases, but on average four to five years, and maybe up to a third of patients can develop this effect. The growth hormone axis is actually particularly sensitive to radiation problems. Um, and um, whilst it, the, basically the duration to developing growth hormone deficiency can take longer with lesser doses of radiation, ultimately with time you can still develop growth hormone deficiency. Obviously the bigger the dose initially, the, the shorter the duration of time to get growth hormone deficiency. So retesting after childhood growth hormone treatment is very, very important because as you'll see here, a number of patients, a number of children actually become normal as they go into adulthood. And so it's not a, a sine qua non, it's not a given that just because you have growth hormone treatment in your childhood that you would need it in your adulthood. So we retest all of, all of those children. Growth hormone deficiency is common following traumatic brain injury or brain bleed. Um, and you can see some figures there about you know, 20, 25% 
of those patients may be affected. And we're not currently screening these people because we haven't got the resources to do all the stimulation testing, etc. but we're currently looking at that here at, the, at this hospital. Now IGF-1, which is a measure from, it's a liver protein that measures, let's say, the average effect of growth hormone through the body, and I say that very loosely. On its own, so you hear about people, when, you, when you're on growth hormone treatment, people would measure IGF-1 to tailor their treatment, but on its own as a diagnostic tool is not a very good test of growth hormone deficiency. Of course, the majority of people have low IGF-1 levels, um, but there are certainly normal individuals, uh, sorry, growth hormone deficient individuals who have normal IGF-1 levels. Generally speaking though, given that I showed you that graph where the, as you get more pituitary axes deficient, you're almost 100% likely to develop pituitary uh, growth hormone deficiency. If you have a low IGF-1 and you're deficient in all other pituitary hormones, we say you are growth hormone deficient, okay? But for the PBS, this wasn't good enough. <laughs> So this is why we've had to pull off all these people off growth hormone who have been lucky enough to getting it privately funded, but who now can transition to PBS treatment. And we've had to do stimulation testing, even though we know they're growth hormone deficient. So it's a bit of a problem, but that was, at least we're getting somewhere with the funding. So we put up with it. And there's three types of tests that one can do. And what dynamic testing does in the pituitary is it, it tries to, to simulate normal physiology. So if you stress the pituitary by a physical means, with an insulin tolerance test, we drop your blood sugar, which is a big potent stimulus to the pituitary. An arginine and a glucagon test are somewhat less clear how they stress the pituitary, but they do. And under those circumstances in normal glands, you should produce large volumes of growth hormone, okay, under degrees of stress. So that's what we're trying to do is mimic a natural stress and then see what the response is, all right? And so we have the PBS has certain cutoffs that are very clear and defined. And until a few days ago, excitingly, you needed to also fulfill a quality of life questionnaire. So you needed to have a poor enough quality of life on this standardized test in order to qualify for growth hormone treatment. But excitingly, as of September the 1st, you no longer have to have a quality of life questionnaire. You purely have to have the dynamic testing and that's enough to qualify. And the reason for it's not because the quality of life questionnaire was, was you know, it's a very validated questionnaire. It's been used in research for many, many years. But obviously you can train patients to say exactly what you want in a quality of life questionnaire and it doesn't really reflect it, it's, it's just hard to do it when you're trying to cross the line for a criteria. So I think it was realised that it was really not reflecting the true situation. So as of September 1st, it's out and you just need the absolute um, markers according to the dynamic testing. So the problem with which we face now, in our unit we have a wait list. Christine, I don't know what it is, it might be like three months to get a stimulation test done. Um, because it has to be done in a specialised endocrine testing unit. We need a specialised nurse like Christina, who's done this multiple times, to be able to do it. So we need it the properly sort of set up, and there are only a few of these around town. So I've talked about the insulin tolerance test. It's really the gold standard for diagnosing adult growth hormone deficiency, but it does have limitations in clinical practice. You need almost two doctors in the room, because if you drop a blood sugar level and someone has a fit, then you need to be able to resuscitate them. Obviously we want to avoid that, so we tend to try and um, limit who we do that to, so we won't do it to an older individual, obviously anyone with a history of epilepsy or even cardiovascular um, disease. Um, and the side effects um, are predominantly those of what would happen when you drop someone's blood sugar. So you get sweaty, clammy, you might feel a bit fatigued, have a few heart racing sensations, get a bit confused and potentially a bit dizzy, and very rarely seizures though. Most people tolerate it very well, and then we rescue people once we've got you down enough. But it's a pretty primitive test. It's pretty unpleasant. So we moved, we've moved a lot towards using glucagon. Um, and the mechanism, though, as I suggested, is really unclear as to how it induces growth hormone release. It's some form of a stress, and it's been well known and studied over many, many years. And it's much simpler to perform than an insulin tolerance test. It doesn't, I think it requires um, a doctor around, but not necessarily in the room at the time, um, and it takes four hours as opposed to a few more hours. The side effects of glucagon um, are predominantly around nausea and vomiting, and we do have ways of trying to counterbalance that. Um, and really problems with blood sugar don't occur, but are reported. And we really found that it's very well tolerated, 
um, and so we, we tend to run with that one. This is an example of what we would see when we're then getting the test results. So in the blue boxes, you can see someone with growth hormone deficiency, and you can see in the third line down, someone with severe deficiency literally will not have, you can't detect growth hormone even with any form of stimulus. But the growth hormone partial might go up a little bit, but does not, um, these units are actually different to the PBS units, so this person is, still would qualify. Um, and so they get a little bit of a rise after about, you know, two and a half hours. They'll get a little bit of a rise for growth hormone, but, it, but um, not normal rises in growth hormone. Whereas you see the, the bottom response in green, you get a very brisk, nice rise in someone who's got a normal growth hormone axis. So that's how we, we analyse the results. So how is it given? Well, it is an injection, unfortunately. Um, but the, there are nice pens, just like insulin pens, that really, it's not painful at all. Um, and there's two current brands that are on the PBS. There are multiple other brands around. They're all the same drug, but these two are currently on PBS. There probably will be others that will follow as well. Um, and on the horizon, there are clinical trials that are assessing weekly and even monthly growth hormone preparation. So maybe it'll be less difficult as time goes on. What are the potential growth hormone side effects? Dose-related side effects are joint pains and swelling. Um, there is, in multiple studies now, been reassurance of no increased risk of recurrence or progression of pituitary tumours or craniopharyngiomas in long-term studies. There was theoretical risk that if you give growth hormone, you may make other things grow, um, but that's been discounted. So you can feel very confident that you're not gonna have any problems with that from growth hormone. There is a small risk of a slight increase in blood sugar and we just monitor and adjust medications if necessary. And retinal eye changes, I've never seen it. It's a very rare reported complication. So overall, a very safe effect. When we have someone on treatment, we monitor them regularly. We look at their weight, hopefully it's reducing, their waist circumference is reducing, and most importantly for them often, quality of life improves. We measure the IGF-1, we measure cholesterol, we measure sugars, we measure thyroid function. You may require an increase in thyroid hormone or hydrocortisone once you start growth hormone. Um, and also women who are on estrogen replacement, if you're on oral estrogen, because of the way it's metabolized through the liver, you will need much higher doses to overcome some of the um, metabolism issues in the liver, which is very complicated, but you'll need much higher doses of growth hormone versus if you were taking, um, having patch or gel-based estrogen administration. So we try to put people onto transdermal skin-based estrogen treatment. And we may also look at quality of life, your bones as well, okay? So what are the benefits of growth hormone treatment? Well, pretty much reversal of all of the abnormalities I showed you in the beginning. Um, there is a clear reduction, this is a nice um, demonstration on CT scan, of the reduction in abdominal fat. So improvement in exercise capacity and leg muscle has also been clearly demonstrated. So what I'm trying to demonstrate here is there's a lot of science behind the benefits of growth hormone replacement. We're not just relying on patients to tell us that they feel better, there is a lot of science behind it. Bone density increases with growth hormone treatment. These are nice two studies, um, both in um, spine and hip um, studies, of around 5% increase in the spine over five years and two and a half in the hip on average, but men seem to gain more than women in terms of the effects of growth hormone in the bone. And this was a study that showed that the quality of life as determined by the partners of people with growth hormone deficiency was quite clearly um, beneficial. Um, they were more alert, more active, they had higher induce, uh, endurance, less easily annoyed, less worried, more extroverted, more industrious, happier, better looks. I don't know if I'd report better looks in general, but maybe because people who'd seem happier probably seem to have better looks, I suppose. Um, fewer family conflicts, better personal relationships and more satisfied with their occupation. So definitely improvements almost across the domains. Um, and this is also a study to show that the quality of life and healthcare utilisation also improves quite dramatically over 12 months of treatment. Less sick leave, less hospitalisation, more um, leisure time, less assistance with daily activity and overall better quality of life. And really the time to develop this, you might need to wait up to a year to really get the benefit of the growth hormone treatment. So it doesn't happen after one day, it takes a little bit of time for the body to get that benefit. So again, I ask my patients, now that you're on growth hormone treatment, because it's been available, so a lot of people transitioning to PBS, how do you feel? 
I feel like my old self. I've gained so much of my life back. It's much easier to get up in the morning and go to work. I've re-engaged with social activities. I cope better with a busy schedule. I'm actively participating in life. I have more clarity to handle any, everything that life throws at me. My mood and memory have improved. My weight has reduced. I wake feeling better rested. I'm more motivated. I can concentrate better. My muscle strength is much better. I'm more content. And I like this one. Everything has come into color and focus. So just to end, again, this patient here, put back onto growth hormone, can get back into the things she enjoyed. I'm not advocating bodybuilding at all. <laughs> but just to illustrate uh, some of the, the benefits there. And that's it. So I'm open to questions. Thank you. So, and once you stabilize onto a level of growth hormone, does that vary over time? Does that vary? Yeah. Does the dose vary? No, not, not commonly. It's actually fairly predictable. I usually start men need a little bit less than women generally um, so i start with a certain dose and most of the time as long as i'm getting the igf1 in that lower normal part of the range most people that's where the benefit occurs so i rarely have to change the dose much i'm just going through this business now i just feel i filled out the questionnaire which now i think is necessary but uh, what's this uh, i've been off the growth hormone i think for over six months uh, you know, it's apparently that was part of the protocol you had to go off it for a while, I think, or not. We only do a month. I've seen people deteriorate within a couple of weeks. Yeah. Anyway, so what, what's the next step? You've gone off it. You've, you've had, had the stimulation test. No, I've had the, the, the normal blood test I have. So you need to get your doctor to send yeah. you to someone like Christina for the stimulation yeah. test. And then that's what you need to satisfy the government. Okay, thank you. Um, given that there's no risk in the um, progression of a cranial, my son has a cranial pharyngioma, and given that there's no risk with the increase or progression of the disease, why is it that you have to wait for 12 months before growth hormone is um, is suggested? According to PBS, because he's just finished training. No, you don't have to wait for PBS. You just have to qualify. No, so he was on growth now, hormone. Now, okay, so there's, in children, you have to wait till you're 18 to get be able to do this. This is totally just adult. I can't comment on what happens with children because I don't treat children. Okay. Right, so there might be some other nuances to the getting childhood-related growth hormone okay. that I'm afraid I can't really give you, but this is adult. Okay. And how do you determine when somebody does need growth hormone replacement? If if someone had, is on all the pituitary replacement, hydrocortisone, thyroxin, estrogen or testosterone, um, I will suggest it. I will say, how do you feel? How do you feel on this replacement? You often get the sense that someone's much better than they were and you've juggled with a few of those hormones but not quite back to what they could have been or what they were like before. So just like those discussions, they're just not their old self. I mean, it's very seems very vague and patients, I think, feel that they're, they're somehow, because it is so non-specific, they're alone in that feeling of, I'm not quite right. And that's why I put up, that there's almost, everybody feels the same. When you go and ask people, how were you before? They're all the same sort of comments. So even though they're non-specific, they do fall into very similar patterns of description of how you are. Um, and so I'll tend to suggest it. Now, a lot of endocrinologists probably aren't as confident with growth hormone replacement, may not suggest it. You might have to, be the more forthcoming, hey, what about growth hormone, unfortunately. But I think as PBS, now we get used to the PBS, hopefully more endocrinologists start to feel more comfortable with using it um, and, and maybe offer it more to their patients. I think the other thing is, so if somebody is on a couple of replacements and things aren't just quite right, I'm, you know, we'll look at a dynamic test. Let's have a look at it and see if you are growth hormone deficient without necessarily being sure that they might be deficient. But it's worthwhile looking at it. Hi, Em. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to you and your colleagues for chipping away at the getting the PBS, getting it recognised. So 
who's on every other hormone, maybe they're also growth hormone deficient. Of course they had growth hormone excess in the past, but that doesn't rule them out from now many years later actually having growth hormone deficiency. I remember saying this to one of my patients with this situation who just said exactly what all of these patients have been saying, are just going downhill in the last few years. And I suggested maybe we should look at growth hormone. And he looked at me like, what? But I had excess growth hormone in the past, are you crazy? But in fact, you know, that is probably what he's got is now a state of growth hormone deficiency, giving him these um, other symptoms. So we're looking at it. So I think you don't have, just because you've had acromegaly in the past, if you've had all of the other treatments <coughs> and you're deficient in all the other axes, it's quite highly likely if you're still in remission from acromegaly, you actually have deficiency. So. I just wondered if it's possible for someone with a prolactinoma to develop growth hormone deficiency. Yeah, it depends. Again, it's not, not to do with the subtype, it's to do with um, the effect of the tumour or the treatment of the tumour as to whether someone will develop it. So any of the subtypes can develop growth hormone deficiency. Thanks. Including acromegaly. That's what I was making that 